Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Touched by Butterflies, Ecological Education in the Rawson Native Butterfly House with Dr. Chris Barnhart. My name is Erica Van Vrinken. I'm the Outreach and Special Projects Coordinator for the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, will read those out to Dr. Barnhart. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. Dr. Chris Barnhart is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Missouri State University. He studies the conservation-related biology of mollusks and butterflies and collaborates with agencies concerned with endangered species restoration and aquatic toxicology. Chris and his wife, Deborah, create the Bill, Dr. Bill Roston Native Butterfly House at the Springfield Green County Botanical Center, which he will be telling us more about today. So I will turn it over to Dr. Barnhart. Thank you, Erica, and welcome, everybody. I guess we've uh, got a little bit of advertising here to start with, uh, and thank yous for the Grow Native program. All right, the title of the talk today is Touched by Butterflies, and I sort of went around and around exactly what I would emphasize in this talk, so we'll, we'll see how it turns out, but I should be able to get finished comfortably in 45 minutes and, and leave some time for questions. Uh, this is my attempt at an outline. We live in an increasingly artificial world, uh, one that's dominated by screens, large and small, and connections with nature are increasingly tenuous, especially for children. And I think that these connections are important. And I'd like to make an argument that butterflies and their native host plants are a, an easy path to ecological awareness, kind of a painless way to get there. And that live displays and citizen science are especially important for this and that they can promote the uh, aspirations of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and others uh, for urban rewilding and suburban rewilding, trying to restore native habitats as much as we can in places where we actually live. And although uh, I've got a picture of a monarch here for starters, and I'll talk quite a bit about monarchs, uh, what I really wanted to emphasize is how much more there is to it than monarchs if we're thinking of butterflies. Well, you're all familiar with the basic problems that we face in conservation. Uh, in Missouri, 63% of the land is in some form of agriculture. That includes row crops and pasture. And that's not going to go away. We've got to eat. And then there's uh, another large chunk of land. In fact, four and a half times more area than our state park system, which is an excellent park system. And that's turf lawns. And this is the, the matrix that we live in. We've just got a tiny fraction of the land that is supporting some semblance of the native community of plants and animals. And we have access, uh, for better or worse, to plants from all over the world, like these ginkgo trees in an urban setting. And they're beautiful and they're interesting in their own right. But as far as caterpillars are concerned and all the things that depend on them, uh, these might as well be plastic trees there's really very little, if anything, that eats them. And uh, this this goes across across the way. Uh, this is a, a burning bush, euonymus shrub. I found this picture on a native wildflowers nursery. Uh, and of course, people plant these plants because they're beautiful, number one, and, and also because nothing eats them. And for this reason, the foliage is always intact and they look beautiful. And that's a problem. Our friend Doug Tallamy, I'm sure, is well known to most of you. And Doug is a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. He's done more than almost anyone uh, to get out this message about the importance of native plants in horticulture and landscaping. He's published several books. He has some um, great websites. He's got a very ambitious lecture schedule. He's been here in Springfield to lecture, and I heard him talk and it's a great message. And of course, uh, his message is that what you plant matters, that plant feeding insects depend on native plants and that those insects in turn are critical food for birds and other wildlife. His latest uh, effort here is called Homegrown National Park. And if you haven't visited the website for that, I do recommend it. 
it's uh, it's really interesting. It's got an interactive map, and I'm ashamed to say that the park that I'm uh, involved with here in Springfield isn't on that map yet. But it's a place where you can record your efforts to to rewild your property to uh, to plant it in native plants in support of conservation. Talmy's work again it shows the importance of native plants in supporting insects, which are uh, the critical link in the food chain for birds and other wildlife. And he got this great top 10 list, which puts oaks right at the top. My yard is uh, mostly oaks, and I love them and I hate them because of the, the litter that they drop. But litter is a good thing, too. They drop catkins in the spring that clog the gutters, but they also provide cover for a lot of stuff. And of course, they drop acorns. They support 534 species, oaks in general, support 534 species of butterflies and moths. And then there's the mast crop as well. And uh, Talamy's research, it, it emphasizes caterpillars in the food chain. A single pair of breeding chickadees, he found, must find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear a single clutch of young. That's a lot of caterpillars. Believe me, I know. I raise about 1,500 caterpillars a year, and that occupies a couple of months of my wife and, and my time. It's a lot of work. So the formula here is native plants yield insects, which yield birds. Now, I got to admit, I'm a little bit jealous of the, the bird community. I mean, the caterpillars are important, too, in their own right, and I guess that's an argument that I want to make. Uh, another perspective on the value of insects, other than being bird food, is uh, they are promoted as pollinators. Uh, bees and beetles and flies are probably a lot more effective pollinators than most butterflies and moths are. But butterflies uh, and moths do serve niche roles in pollination. Uh, these swallowtail butterflies, for example, are the only effective pollinators of, uh, of azaleas, at least North American azaleas. And the whole flower is set up to be pollinated by butterfly wing beats that pick up pollen from the anthers and deposit it on the pistil. And these, of course, are way out away from the part of the flower that yields the nectar. And so they're essentially inaccessible to other pollinators like bees. But in any event, butterflies are probably not really major pollinators outside, as I say, of a few niche relationships like this. And ironically, much of the current interest in butterfly conservation is focused on one species, the migratory monarch. And the monarch is neither a pollinator nor is it bird food. It's, it's well, well adapted to avoid being bird food by accumulating toxins from the larval food plant, if you know. Now, that doesn't mean the monarchs aren't important in conservation. They certainly are. Uh, the monarch's a genuine celebrity. I can still remember, I wasn't very old at the time, I guess I was 14, when uh, National Geographic published the discovery of the monarch roosting grounds, their overwintering grounds in Mexico. And uh, this is credited to Fred and Nora Urquhart. Uh, Fred was a professor at Carleton University in Canada. And this was a, a childhood obsession with him that he took into his professional career to find out where the monarchs went every winter. And he developed the tagging program, the initial tagging program. And of course, there was no internet then. And he had to do this all by advertisements in newspapers, magazines, and by mail. And a fellow named Ken Brueger and a woman named Catalina Trail, his partner, uh, became part of this search in Mexico and eventually uh, found the, uh, the roosting site, which was well known to the native folks down there. But this was a, a big discovery and it's, it's a compelling story. And of course, it's still compelling us because through the, the tagging efforts, we now know not only where they go, but we can follow their trials and tribulations. And you're probably aware that the numbers of monarchs that occupy the roost has gone down and down and down since uh, effective monitoring started to take place in the early 90s. And it's, it's plateaued pretty much for the last 10 or 15 years, but this is still, of course, of great concern. Why are the monarchs in trouble? Well, here they do have importance as a, a poster child, if you will. Research generally supports the hypothesis that increase 
use of herbicides of Roundup or glyphosate uh, is a problem because we've got genetically modified crops that have been made resistant to glyphosate. This in turn allows farmers to put as much glyphosate as they need and want onto their crops to eradicate the milkweed without eradicating their crops. And the uh, overspray, of course, affects milkweeds, not just in the crop fields, but also adjacent. And there are, there are good data that show that the abundance of milkweeds has been reduced as a result. So that, that's an interesting and complex story. Of course, it is a correlation. So here's the decline in overwintering hectares of monarchs in Mexico. And here is the advent of herbicide tolerant plants might be more convincing if it was the application of Roundup. But the, uh, the result of this was that the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned in 2014 to list the monarch as a threatened species. And this petition was prepared by the Center for Food Safety, which is concerned about genetically modified crops, the Xerxes Society, the, the conservation uh, nonprofit, that is a non-government organization that's concerned with invertebrates, and Dr. Lincoln Brower, a longtime monarch researcher, uh, recently deceased. The status assessment took a long time to be prepared. This is pretty standard for the Fish and Wildlife Service. They're woefully understaffed. It was completed in 2020, just in time for the decision, which was promised for four years for 2020, and then in December, the statement was that they would. They found that there was reason to list the species, but they had higher priorities. So I think this was listed in the New York Times as sort of sidestepping the issue temporarily. But it's supposed to come up again next year, and uh, the monarch may or may not be listed as threatened or endangered. Why is that an issue? Well, because of the Endangered Species Act, which drives a lot of conservation actions. In 2020, this is probably the most significant event that's that's come out of the, the imminent listing of the species, and that is the, the Monarch Butterfly Nationwide Candidate Conservation Agreement on Energy and Transport Lands. I don't have a good acronym for that. It's a lengthy thing, but what this is, is agencies, corporations, and private landholders agree to provide habitat. And of course, this means planting milkweed largely to provide habitat on public and private lands. And in return, in a very general sense, they are off the hook. In case of future actions that might follow listing to preserve the species, and they're also off the hook for any incidental take should the species become listed as threatened or endangered. So it's a good deal right around because the monarch gets more habitat, and this is a lot. There's a lot of agencies and folks that have signed on for this. And those agencies and folks, of course, are, are better off because they can plan for the future. In a way, it's kind of extortion by, by the conservation community, but, but it's a, it really is a win-win situation. Well, this is great for monarchs. Uh, but monarchs are just one species, a highly specialized one, charismatic, no doubt, because of the migration. But it's just one species out of over 10,000 native moth and butterfly species in our area alone, and 450 bees, and I don't know how many flies and beetles and so on. So it's a, it's a little bit of an issue, and we need to move beyond monarchs and milkweeds, in my opinion. And we need to build public appreciation of native biodiversity of plants and animals generally, including insects. I'm not a professional entomologist. I don't even work on things as glamorous as insects. I've spent my career working on freshwater mollusks, freshwater bivalves, which are basically living rocks that live buried in the bottom of streams and lakes. Uh, butterflies are a big step up for me. I've been interested in them since I was a kid, but. I've only started to do research on them fairly recently. I think we need to educate, and Missouri Prairie Foundation is a big part of this, about the interdependence of plants and insects and animals in general, including birds, because there's a lot of birders out there. And of course, we need to promote 
uh, horticultural and landscaping practices that emphasize native plants and replace this uh, 300,000 hectares in Missouri of turf with native plants that support wildlife. And going beyond that, support sustainable agriculture that minimizes pesticide use and herbicide use. So finally, uh, I come around to the, the Dr. Bill Roston Ozark Native Butterfly House. That's the full name of our little institution here in Springfield, established in 2009 through the energies of Dr. Bill Roston, uh, who at the time was a retired, nearly retired, soon to be retired. Actually, he ended up working practically to the end of his life, but a uh, medical doctor from Forsyth. And uh, Bill was uh, a serial fanatic. Uh, I ran into him when he was in his freshwater photography phase and had taken pictures of freshwater mussels, which are my, my research animal, and had questions about them. And the answers led uh, Bill and I to, to work together for many years. And then he, uh, he went into a phase where he was interested in, in butterflies and in, in butterfly houses. And he had visited several and decided that we needed one in Springfield and that it would be a native butterfly house. Not one of these commercial operations that you see, but one that would be free to the public and would emphasize native species and would display both the insects and the butterflies. And, and Bill drug me into this. And then about three years later, he had a stroke and, and I inherited a lot of the responsibility, certainly not all, but uh, it's uh, been kind of a consuming passion for the, the last 14 years and we're still having a lot of fun with it. It's a net house in a really nice uh, park here in southwestern Springfield. And it's not a big thing. It's not a butterfly palace by any means, but uh, it serves the purpose. We are riding a wave of interest in butterfly houses, I think. Uh, some people say it's the age of municipal aquariums. Well, it's certainly the age of butterfly houses too. There's a lot of good ones and new ones around the world. Uh, Sophia Sachs Butterfly House up by St. Louis is a relatively new one that is state of the art, uh, spectacular. There are seasonal displays at some places like Powell Gardens in Kansas City or at the Crone Conservatory in uh, Cincinnati that are not butterfly houses year round, but do big butterflies displays seasonally. And then there's some really top notch museums like the Audubon Insectarium that uh, go above and beyond the display of, of uh, you know, just pretty flying critters and, and get into some, uh, some really nice interpretive work. Uh, the Audubon Insectarium is in New Orleans. It's currently closed. It closed in 2020, one of the first uh, victims of the pandemic, you might say, but they, they took advantage of the opportunity. They knew they wanted to expand and relocate. They were stuck in the old customs house in uh, New Orleans, which was not a big facility. So over the last couple of years, they've been rebuilding it and merging it with the aquarium. And when they reopen next year, it should be spectacular. It already was. They've got these fantastic interpretive displays about how insects in general affect society and have affected history. So if you're in the, in the neighborhood next year, I highly recommend that you visit this place. Uh, most butterfly houses are maybe uh, a little bit different from that though. The commercial butterfly houses, and there are many around the world, they, uh, they usually vary somewhat in sophistication, but they almost always display mainly tropical species, not native species. They'll be showy tropical species and tropical flowers, and they will not display caterpillars. They display uh, animals that they purchase. They get the, the butterflies as pupae from, from dealers in the tropics, and it's, it's kind of a mishmash, and it, it emphasizes spectacle. And I I like to say that it's butterfly pornography because they take these incredible animals and they take them out of their habitat and they, they plunk them down in a tropical greenhouse that looks like it might be the habitat, but it's really not. It's just a convenient selection of pretty things for people to look at. 
So I am kind of dissing on commercial butterfly houses. We, on the other hand, have a, a butterfly shack, not a butterfly palace or a butterfly tent. Uh, it's just a big hoop house. And uh, we've we've upgraded over the years. We installed brick floor, but many of the plantings in here are the originals from 2009. We've got uh, tulip poplar trees. If you know those, they can get 100 feet high in this length of time, but ours is uh, bonsai. It's uh, it's bigger than this. This picture is a little old, but it still fits. And we've got, you know, all these 14-year-old trees in here that we've managed to contain within the boundaries of this net house. We display in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 species at any point in time. And we try to have host plants for everything that we display so that they can lay their eggs and people can see their whole life cycle. We've got docents in the butterfly house and the docents are there to answer questions and to kind of ride herd on the kids so they don't get out of hand. And we've got, I would say, a minimum of interpretive materials on display, but we do have signage and the signage emphasizes, here's the butterfly, this is what it is, and here's what it eats. The connection between the host plant and the butterfly is, is the big message here. And again, it's the whole life cycle. It's caterpillars and plants, not just butterflies. And we have events where we, uh, this is our annual butterfly festival, where we'll get maybe a thousand people come through in a day and we really rub their noses in what plants you need to have which butterflies. And, you know, people like caterpillars, at least most people like caterpillars. Sometimes there's a little bit of a gross out factor. And of course, uh, the caterpillars have an image problem because this is what eats your garden plants. This is what eats your uh, tomatoes. This is what eats your parsley. But that's not a bad thing necessarily if you start to appreciate the animals. Pawpaw is uh, very popular in the butterfly house. We get a lot of people asking questions about our pawpaw. They're in full fruit right now. And of course, they are the only host for a native butterfly, the zebra swallowtail. And it's a spectacular display butterfly. It's one of my favorites. They have this, this floating flight that is just very attractive. And the caterpillars are cool too. So this is you know, we've got 15 or 20 of these kinds of connections and relationships that people can see and learn about. We try to appeal to all ages. We get a little bit silly about it. You know, our, our chrysalis hatching boxes have furniture and, you know, sometimes people seriously ask, do they use the rocking chair? And I say, sure. <laughs> if they happen to land on it, they'll use it. Uh, we've got little solar fountains, which uh, serve as watering stations for the butterflies. And, uh, you know, this is a draw for the kids, but the kids are a draw for their parents. So we'll do whatever it takes to keep people interested. We, uh, we educate our docents more heavily maybe than we do our visitors. We give uh, introductory lectures every year for the docents and try to get them uh, and the swing of identifying things. Of course, we've got 130 butterfly species in our area, so that's a little bit overwhelming. But there's only five families, so if, if you learn the answer to what is that, well, that is a brushfoot butterfly. You know, if you don't have any other answer, that's a that's a pretty good one. We uh, we do display moths too because moths are 94% of the species of scaly winged insects. The Lepidoptera, North of Mexico, butterflies only 6%. And probably the most common question is, what's the difference between a moth and a butterfly? And of course, the kids all know that, but the parents don't. And of course, the big difference is that moths are night flyers. And so people don't know them as well as they do butterflies. But the moths are far more diverse and ecologically, certainly they're more important. So we don't neglect them. Uh, we participate in National Moth Week which is a, a great idea. And the usual expression of this is to go out and put up a sheet and put mercury vapor lights on it so that everybody can see what, what arrives. And we do this every year and we really enjoy it. This always reminds me of uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper for some reason. Everybody's looking at the light here, the big draw. 
And you'll see spectacular things, things that are passing through your backyard, but you don't know they're there until you make an effort to draw them in and get a good look. Moths are anything but drab. Some of them are subtly colored, but some are outrageous, like this rosy maple moth. And uh, we raise the butterflies. This is uh, another thing that, that I think is very important. We, we don't try to just go out and collect things. Uh, we raise the species that we display. You might have to collect a few to get things started, put a few females in, they lay eggs on the host plants. And then to some extent, they raise themselves in the butterfly house, but to a much greater extent, we, we take them home because the survivorship in the butterfly house is pretty much what it is in nature. You know, if a butterfly lays a thousand eggs, two in a thousand will survive. But uh, if you take them home, you can get 900 out of a thousand to survive. So we raise a lot of butterflies at home. And this is my wife and I, and, and a number of volunteers that do this. These are great spangled fritillary. Somebody pointed out to me that, that touched can mean, you know, this kind of touched. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we border on that. Uh, sometimes it gets out of hand. We're usually not this tidy. I won't show you what the dining room table looks like at this time of the year. And uh, this is what things look like going into the fall. We try to overwinter enough chrysalis and cocoons of, of each species so that we can start them in the spring. Because, you know, if we don't have chrysalis in the spring, we won't have butterflies for weeks. But this way, uh, we can get things started as soon as they start in the field. And, uh, you know, raising butterflies is fun. And the kids get into it. School teachers are always asking for livestock. This little girl came to the Butterfly Festival with her her single monarch that she had raised. And I think that picture is just iconic. And this is Lila. Now, Lila is a return visitor. Lila has been a, a butterfly girl since she was about six years old. And she's uh, a docent in the butterfly house now. And every year she raises quite a few uh, swallowtail butterflies in particular. And Xander is another one who's kind of grown up in the butterfly house. And uh, a couple of years ago, Xander had a lemonade stand and he made $37 and donated it all to the butterfly house. One of the real delights has been watching these kids grow up over the last uh, 14 years when they keep coming back. So what, what can you learn from the butterfly house? Well, uh, you can learn about ecological communities, for example, and you can learn about uh, the balance of nature and you can learn about sex. We get lots of questions when the butterflies are mating about life and death because there are always going to be dead butterflies in the butterfly house. And there's uh, lessons, of course, about human nature. And of course, not everybody has realistic views. There's a lot of people with very unrealistic views of nature. Uh, some people come in and they expect Butterflies and moths are like little puppy dogs that they're they're each individuals and they're like little people and we must cherish every one. I think my wife Deb borders on this sometimes. She won't throw a caterpillar away. Um, I treat them more like plants. You know, I, I don't mind deadheading a few. And it's gruesome. Predators and parasites are part of the game and people need to learn that. They honestly do. So wasps, you know, nobody likes wasps. They sting and they eat caterpillars for Pete's sake. So we, we really don't want them in the butterfly house. If they, if they learn there's a hole in the net, they'll come and go and they'll, uh, they'll treat a caterpillar just like a hunter treats a deer. You know, they'll gut it and take the meat and fly away with it and feed their babies. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It all depends. We've got other kinds of wasps, parasitoids, this is really insidious. They lay their eggs on the caterpillar just as it's pupating. And then the chrysalis, you're waiting for the butterfly to come out and instead out pops a bunch of little parasitoid wasps that go off to, to parasitize more caterpillars. Yeah, it's disappointing if you're raising them, but these are all part of the balance of nature. If it were not for the predators and the parasites, and if all thousand of those butterfly eggs survived, then soon there would be no food for the butterflies or for us and everything would die. So again, you get your nose rubbed in it in the butterfly house. 
It's a lesson in the balance of nature. If you don't have paper wasps picking off those caterpillars that are eating your kale or cabbage, pretty soon it's gone. And this is just the way things are. There are lessons about diversity here too. This is maybe not very subtle, but this is a Virginian tiger moth. And this is one clutch of caterpillars, they're siblings. And they come in white and they come in brown and they come in black. And so do people. You know, it's a simple message for kids and for grownups too. And uh, of course, lessons about uh, communities, about ecological communities and conservation. Uh, this is uh, a regal fritillary. And some of you may know that uh, we've been doing work on regal fritillaries for the last few years. That because we uh, worked on great spangled fritillaries and we learned a lot about raising them. And I got to talking with Steve Buback at the conservation department a few years ago and said, you know, I'd like to try this with regals. I think we could learn a lot. Uh, when we had caterpillars, we could do things with them that would tell us more that we don't know because there's vanishingly little known, little known about the early stages of the life cycle of regal fritillaries. It's easy to find them on the prairie, but it's extremely difficult to find the early life stages unless you rear them. And it turns out they're not that hard to rear. Well, what do they need? They're a, they're a habitat specialist. And of course, what they need is prairie. Why do they need prairie? Well, they need it because that's where they find their food and their shelter, and they've co-evolved with that habitat, and they're absolutely dependent on it. So it's not only the caterpillars plant. The caterpillars eat violets. Well, violets are generally distributed, but they, uh, they feed on violets on the prairie. And then they have just a single generation each year, and the adult butterflies, the, the females at least, live the entire summer. The adult females have to spend about uh, four months on the prairie to complete their life cycle, and they only lay their eggs in the month of September. So over that long haul between uh, May and September, they have to find food. And that can't be just one kind of nectar producing plant. It has to be a series. So what I'm saying is uh, it takes a prairie to make a fritillary. Now, to paraphrase that African proverb about villages and children, it takes a prairie to make a fritillary. You, you can't have them without that whole suite of plants and uh, aspects of the physical habitat that we're only beginning to understand. Can we intervene? Uh, yeah, we can intervene by preserving prairie. And Prairie Foundation seems to be doing a great job of that. Can we help them out in other ways. Well, what we decided that we would do since we were quite successful this past year was we decided we would release caterpillars and a few adults on the prairies that didn't have them. You know, the, the Achilles heel for prairie is fragmentation. We've only got a little bit of it left and it's scattered around in little patches, many of them 40 or 50 acres. And it's easy for an event perhaps even a management fire that gets out of hand and burns the whole prairie. It's easy for these stochastic events to extirpate the butterflies locally. And they may not come back because they're homebodies. And even though they're strong flyers, they tend to turn back from boundaries. If they're passing from a prairie to a roadway or into a cornfield, they'll turn around and go back. So a patch of prairie can go without fritillaries for a very long time. Well, we decided we'd try putting them back. And uh, here's Xander again and his wife, Amanda, I'm sorry, his mother, Amanda, uh, one of a number of people, uh, many professionals and volunteers that helped us put regal fritillaries back on seven different prairies this past spring. And did it work? Well, yeah, we think it did. Uh, we saw fritillaries on several prairies. The real question is, will they be back next year? Will they successfully lay eggs and reproduce on those remnants? We hope so. I wanna show you another example of connectivity here. Prairies are isolated, yes, but, but the insects, uh, particularly things like monarchs, of course, can take advantage of resources on prairies and then fly elsewhere. This is another migratory butterfly that uh, we're working with right now. 
uh, to get onto display. It's our butterfly of the week in the butterfly house. This is the cloudless sulfur. And if you are the kind of person that pays attention when you're driving, you may notice these large bright yellow butterflies flying at about 12 or 15 feet of altitude and they're headed south. If you see them in motion, they're headed south and they're headed not for Mexico, but for Florida and the Gulf states. And this is a phenomenon that recurs every year. They feed on partridge pea and related plants. So uh, Deb and I were out at uh, Goodnight Prairie the other day and we found dozens of them feeding on partridge pea there. So the prairie is generating these butterflies and they continue to reproduce on their Southern March and their numbers are building. Uh, this is the caterpillar comes in different colors, depending on whether they're feeding on the flowers or the leaves. This is the chrysalis, easily rivals the monarch chrysalis, just for a, an incredibly beautiful object. And uh, this is the fruit of the prairie that's passing through Springfield right now. Well, I, I got to say uh, some thanks to the volunteers in the Butterfly House, and they, uh, they make it all possible. We've got a, a group fairly stable, maybe a core group of 25 or 30 volunteers that are there year after year, and then other people uh, come and go. And here we're gathered for the Monarch Tag and Release event, which is coming up this year on September 22nd at uh, 2 p.m. If you're interested, come on by. Uh, we will try to have uh, a number of wild caught and captive reared monarchs that we will tag and and send on their way to Mexico using the tags that were developed at KU by the Monarch Watch Group. And this is a significant bit of citizen science that you can contribute to. Our umbrella organization is Friends of the Garden. And uh, we operate the Butterfly House under the auspices of Friends of the Garden. Got uh, a lot of interesting uh, educational activities available too. Uh, our master gardeners operate in the, the park. And uh, I'd love it if some of you folks, if you're in the Springfield area, could join us. And with that, I will ask Carol if there's any questions. I think I'm finishing a little bit early, but, but not too bad. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. Or Dr. Barnhart, sorry. Uh oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm retired. Oh, you're retired. Okay. All right. Chris, it is. Then. Um, we have a, a question. Um, does honeysuckle, and I, I think that she means the non-native invasive honeysuckle, does it have any importance to butterflies or insects in general here in, in Missouri where it's invasive? Yeah, honeysuckle is a bad thing. Uh, it's, it's a bad thing in multiple ways. And I'm, I'm not highly educated on the, the diversity of honeysuckles. We do have natives, of course, and the natives are food for some conspicuous moths and butterflies. If you're familiar with uh, the snowberry hummingbird moth, the, the snowberry sphinx moth, it's a day flying sphinx moth, looks like a little bumblebee when it's when it's hovering around. But one of its food plants besides our native snowberry is our, our native uh, honeysuckles. But uh, things like bush honeysuckle, there's there's no upside to it. It uh, obliterates uh, habitat for natives and uh, not good for wildlife. Uh, they feed it to the large mammals in the Africa section at the Kansas City Zoo, but <laughs> as, as one exotic to another, um, maybe it has some significance there. But no, I I wish it would go away. Uh, the birds eat the berries, but the berries aren't very nutritious compared to the natives that are being replaced. So, sorry. <laughs> the flowers are, are pretty. Thank you, Chris. And regarding the native honeysuckles, uh, that uh, I wanted to note that uh, Erica put in the chat a link to a uh, chart of native plants that are uh, host plants to a number of butterflies and moths, and that was compiled thanks to MPF uh, member Linda Williams, who I think is is uh, uh, attending the, the program right now. Great. Um, hey, can I, uh, should I take these from the top or from the bottom? Oh, I, I can ask that, I can, I can relay them to you. Um, there's another question. Do you know how far the regal fritillary migrates? 
Uh, regal fritillaries do not migrate. Regal fritillaries are homebodies. Now, how far can they travel? There have been tagged individuals, and Dan Marshalek at uh, University of Central Missouri could speak to this because he's had a tagging program for several years. They can travel miles, and they occasionally do, but most of them stay home. So they're, they're not passing through like monarchs. They are resident butterflies here in Missouri, resident on particular prairies. And Chris, I'm glad you mentioned um, Dr. Marshalek's uh, research, and he has found, as, you, as you've noted, that um, regals are flying from prairie remnant to prairie remnant. And I think that uh, underscores uh, the importance of these remnants, even if they're small, if they have the uh, habitat, and in this case, the larval food sources for regals, they're definitely very important for these butterflies and many other species. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, small prairie remnants support a wide variety of plants and animals. And the size of regal populations is not closely correlated with the size of the prairie remnant. You can have very dense populations of regals if everything is right. And on the other hand, they may be you know, few and far between on a large prairie if you know, conditions aren't perfect. So yeah, small prairie remnants are absolutely important. Yes, it's important. I want to answer this, uh, this goat weed question. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> I've got goat weed on the brain. Cheryl asked, was that hog hogwart in the little containers? If so, what insects does it host? Yeah, that's, uh, that's goat weed. And goat weed is the only food for the goat weed leaf wing butterfly, which is uh, an absolutely spectacular little butterfly that, uh, that we try to display in the butterfly house. In fact, it will be our butterfly of the week next week because we've got a lot of chrysalis. Yeah, hogwort and uh, and also prairie tea are the two species of croton that are common. And yeah, I, I, that's, uh, that's why they were there. I wanted to give a shout out to um, Nadia Navarrete Tindall, who um, is at Lincoln University here in Jefferson City and at the Native Plant Outdoor Laboratory. She maintains uh, that goat weed. It almost is kind of like a ground cover in between other plants. Uh, and she she's maintaining it for the goat wing butterfly. And so um, if you if you live in central Missouri, you want to see an example of how that can look in a landscaped area, you can check out the um, uh, native plant outdoor laboratory at Lincoln University. It's actually a grow native garden of excellence. And of course, you have it at the Rostin Butterfly House as well. There's another question. Could you recommend a handful of natives that would have the greatest impact on in terms of food for a variety of butterflies and moths. Wow. Well, I, I would refer you to Talamese websites for that. But uh, I'll tell you what we planted in our yard, what we thought was important. Uh, and we're, we're sort of butterfly centric and, and we're interested particularly in species that we're trying to raise for the butterfly house. So it's, it's convenient to be able to go into the backyard to get food for them. So we, we planted spice bush right away. Spice bush is host for the spice bush swallowtail. It's also uh, host for Promethea moth, which is a, a really nice native silk moth. We planted uh, Telia, that's a wafer ash or hop tree, more of a shrub than a tree really, but it's, uh, it's in the, uh, the citrus family and it's a host for giant swallowtail and some other things as well. But giant swallowtail is a species that we really like to display in the butterfly house. So, so we went for that. Willows, we planted willows in our backyard. They're number two, I think, on Talamese list. And we use them as host for red spotted purple and viceroy butterflies. Uh, we also planted pawpaw. <laughs> and, you know, again, it's a single species that we're after there. We're after zebra swallowtail. And of course, we like the fruit too. In fact, I had it for dessert last night. Uh, with Andy's frozen custard. Pawpaw is fantastic. So uh, th those were the few. We also planted uh, tulip poplar uh, for uh, tiger swallowtail and a lot of other insects. It's a fast growing tree. So those, thanks, those are some of my favorites. Thanks, Chris. And I'm going to put into the chat uh, a link to the Grow Native host with the hosts with the most card. <laughs> 
is information from Talamy's work that lists um, the host plants, both woody plants and non-woody plants that provide for the greatest number of um, butterflies and moths. So that is a quick and easy way to find that information as well. Yeah. So I'll put that in the chat in just a moment. Um, there's uh, a comment from Bob who says the goat wing leaf wing, goat weed leaf wing is interesting as they overwinter as adults. And yeah. of course there are a number of uh, that overwinter as, a, as adults. I'm thinking of um, morning cloak is another one that I'm familiar with. Are there others that overwinter as adults? Yeah, all of the uh, polygonia species. So the question mark, the comma, and uh, the gray comma, th those all overwinter as adults. It, and interestingly, all of those butterflies feed largely on fruit and sap as opposed to flowers. I think that's that's interesting. And uh, if you don't see them visiting your flowers in your garden, don't be disappointed because really what they're after is, uh, well, dog do. <laughs> they, they like dog feces. Uh, they like rotting fruit. Uh, even rotting hedge apples are attractive, that sort of thing. Thank you. And there was a question about the links that we're putting into the chat. Um, those will um, be included in an email that Erica will send out um, probably tomorrow, if not tomorrow, Friday, to everybody who has registered for this webinar. So fear not, you will get those links emailed to you. It's another question from Val. Um, she asks, there's a lot of controversy regarding home raised monarchs uh, and their fitness. Do you have concerns about the butterflies that you are raising? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, there is evidence from one study that home raised monarchs are less fit and there's a lot more evidence that they don't migrate very effectively. Uh, this comes from tagging studies, where if you compare uh, an equal number of monarchs that are caught wild and tagged with those that are home raised and tagged, you get much lower return. Not no return, but lower return on the home raised butterflies. Does that mean that you shouldn't do it? No, it, it means you're probably doing it for the wrong reason. Now, if you raise monarch butterflies uh, during the the summer when they go through four or five generations and turn those loose, then they can go off and potentially raise the numbers of monarchs by laying eggs and you know keeping a population going. But is that a guaranteed thing? No, not necessarily, because it may be that monarchs are already doing just fine in the neighborhood. And uh, you know, if you add more to the population, then you get some density dependent effects like cannibalism that uh, you know you can end up with a plateau where adding more doesn't really increase the successful number that are reproducing. It's a complex issue. Uh, there's also the question of disease. Uh, monarchs are susceptible to a, a protozoan disease that's contagious. And butterflies that are raised in conditions that, that lead to the communication of that disease could potentially spread them. But you can avoid that sort of thing if you're careful. My Thanks. bottom line is that that I think it's an educational exercise and that people should do it for that reason. They should do it so that they can engage their children with nature and so that they can, you know, understand things better. You may learn some things you won't like about monarchs, like the fact that they're cannibals. <laughs> At least the caterpillars are. And some of their relatives are even worse. They're uh, baby blood drinkers. I can tell you more about that if you're interested. But, but monarchs are generally, they're a spectacular and wonderful animal, but as a personality, oh, I like goatweed butterflies much better than I do monarchs. <laughs> goatweed butterflies, they, uh, they live in little houses like hobbits. The, uh, the caterpillars build these little leaf nests and uh, they occupy those. And, and they're crabby little hobbits. If another caterpillar tries to come in, they bop their head up and down. But you do occasionally see them cohabiting. They never cannibalize. I've watched one very carefully eat around an egg of a conspecific to avoid eating it. A monarch would just, oh, there's some, some dessert. 
So, you know, the butterflies have personalities. I don't want to get silly here. And I don't think of them as, as individual personalities, although some of these long live butterflies like fritillaries, you may even get that. But the species, if you learn them by rearing them, if you, you know, become conversant with their peculiarities, it's just another layer of fascination. They're not just pretty. You can love them for their personalities too. They do have personality. Thanks, Chris. Um, Denny asks, small reestablished prairies are becoming more common. What time of year do you recommend for the biennial burning of these prairies to have at least, to have the least effect on butterfly reproduction? And I, I would like to state that um, we can't ever reestablish a prairie in entirety. There are prairie plantings and, and it is great that they are becoming more common, but I do want to emphasize that um, original prairies, once they're gone, they're gone forever. But what, what do you recommend, Chris, for these planted prairies in terms of management to have the least effect or most positive effects on butterfly reproduction? Yeah, these are very difficult, complicated questions, also very controversial. I can only tell you that, that my experience is limited and my experience with late spring fire is not negative. Uh, the, the prairie where we were studying regals before we got into it, we wanted to learn more about their, uh, their timing and their habitat preference and violet densities and so on. This was Comstock Prairie and it, it burned uh, half of it intentionally and the other half through arson in the spring of uh, 2021. And it burned completely. And that was a fairly late fire, much later than people prefer to burn than managers prefer to burn, but you know, there it was. And the Regals did just fine. They were at least as abundant in uh, May after the fire as they were in the May before. This is, this is my limited personal experience is that, that one incident. Now I've read quite a bit of the literature on prairie fire. And although, again, there's controversy, it seems to be settling on the fact that number one, fire is necessary for preserving prairies and you can't have regals without prairies. And number two, uh, if you do it right, it, it benefits them. It doesn't just preserve the prairie, it actually benefits the regal fritillary populations. Typically they're down a little bit in the, the first uh, summer after a burn, but then it goes up and it peaks at about three to five years post fire and then it starts to go down. And if you don't burn again, it'll go, it'll go down substantially. So the largest populations of regals, again, have been seen on prairies that are typically three to five years post burn. And if you don't burn the whole prairie, um, everything kind of averages out. And that's, of course, what, what managers aspire to. Thanks, Chris. And I, I just wanted to mention too, the Missouri Prairie Foundation, we burn portions of our prairies every year um, in the dormant season. Uh, and we're careful to do just portions for the reasons that Chris has stated. Um, there's a question about, is there a link with, photo, with photos of local species of moths and butterfly caterpillars? I'm often finding them in my garden and would like to know who I'm dealing with. And perhaps uh, Chris and others who are tuned in, you could put in the chat some of the um, resources that you might use. Um, iNaturalist is something that, that I have found useful. Chris, what would you suggest? Yeah, I highly recommend iNaturalist. There are other citizen science websites for reporting observations that predate iNaturalist. And some of them are good too, like Bug Guide from Iowa State is a good one. But iNaturalist is, is pretty good for identification. Uh, it's, a, it's a big site. It's not just insects, it's everything. And of course, not everything can be identified from photos. But it's a, a very satisfying site for me. I use it quite a lot. I suppose I could uh, pull it up here just so you can see what we're talking about. This is iNaturalist. Can everybody see that all right? I can see it. Okay. And uh, I got to find my login. You can log in with uh, Google.
and it uh, it's a complicated site. There's a little bit of learning that, that goes into this, but but basically you take a picture, you submit it to the website, and there's an artificial intelligence that looks at your photo and the location where it was taken and suggests what the species might be. So here, this is uh, this is from uh, Goodnight Prairie, I think, and it's uh, prairie rosin weed. Well, now somebody else needs to come along who knows more than I do, and either agree with this or disagree with it and tell me why. So what I'm saying is that the the site is vetted. This is this is their their big. Uh, advance I think over other sites is they make it easy for people to comment and if you put up something common like say a monarch butterfly immediately other people will chime in and say yeah that's a monarch and somebody else says yeah that's a monarch well of course we already knew it was a monarch and if it's something more difficult like say uh, some kind of a fungus or an obscure prairie plant you might have to go and ask somebody for help but you can find people to help because it also tells you you know who's knowledgeable about this and who who does confirm uh, identifications for that particular group and it puts you in touch with naturalists all over the world so enough said about that i highly recommend iNaturalist for a quick identification of a picture that you've taken Oop, that was a monologue that's all right. Thank you, Chris. And uh, another question about what to do with tomato hornworms. And of course, the tomato is a host plant <laughs> for this hornworm, but they do compete with, uh, uh, well, I suppose they compete <laughs> with us in terms of uh, us getting tomatoes. Can you talk about uh, hornworms? Yeah, they uh, they all decimate a tomato plant. So, and, and you feel bad about killing them. But, so put them on your neighbor's tomato plant. <laughs> I'm being silly, but there are native plants. Um, so if you've got a weedy yard, you might have ground cherry. They eat ground cherry just fine. So you can transfer them to, to weeds and you, know, you might just take them out and throw them on the prairie if you're close by to, to some natural area without being too fussy. At least then they can be food for some animal rather than just tossing them in the trash bin. Again, I, I don't get too upset about this stuff. If I was growing tomatoes, I would take them off and I would probably, uh, well, I might very well feed them to the chickens if I had chickens, you know. But uh, th these are the decisions we all have to make if, if we want to go to heaven. Oh, I see Sue Lin is on. Hi, Sue Lin. Yes, she's. I know what Sue Lin does with her extra caterpillars. She brings them to the butterfly house. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, ground cherry, a weedy plant, but native, is in the same family as tomato, the nightshade family, and uh, would be a host plant. Yeah, uh, Sue, Lynn, Sue Lynn lists, lists uh, horse nettle, ground cherry, mm -hmm. also datura, if you've got datura, and it, uh, yeah. In terms of the identification question, Linda has a really good point in the chat. There are more than 2,500 species of Lepidoptera in Missouri. So sometimes you won't get an identification, no matter perhaps what tools you might look at. She mentions that David Wagner's book on caterpillars of the Eastern US is also a great resource that covers the most common ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like Wagner's books. I, let's see, is there another question? Um, oh, yes, there was another question. Do you have any papers available on your butterfly rearing techniques? Uh, I've got a report on the regal fritillary stuff that I, I'm still kicking back and forth with conservation department. But uh, if you want to learn how to raise butterflies, I recommend um, the websites of a fellow named Gosh, now I'm going to blank on his name. I want to say Stout. Let me uh, see if I can jog my memory here. Todd Stout, I think is his name. And he has got some great resources. So his website is raisingbutterflies.org. 
and his name is Todd Stout. And I've, you know, I raised a lot of butterflies. I've looked at his stuff. The advice that he gives is, is sound. He works mostly with Western species, but, uh, and he, he works with commercial growers too. Uh, he's trying to make a living doing this. And I, I don't know how you feel about commercial butterfly growers. There's, there's definitely questions about the impact of raising hundreds or thousands of butterflies for release at weddings and, you know, things of that sort. There, there are legitimate questions about that, but as long as there's an educational component, uh, I think that, that arguments have to be made, you know, in defense of, of raising butterflies and moths. It's, it's a kind of gardening, you know, and you can, you can do it for a lot of different reasons. I think uh, getting to know the, uh, the components of the natural world is, is worthy. It's a worthy exercise. And putting them in front of people so that people can appreciate them, that's also a, a worthy enterprise. Uh, Chris, I think there were just two other questions. One early on when you were talking about willows, someone asked um, what kind of willows? Do you remember? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Weeping willow, uh, black willow, they're host plants for so many different things. Uh, we've raised Cecropia moths, for example, our largest North American moth. We've raised those on weeping willow and black willow, which are two very different trees, if you know them. And, uh, you know, I don't think it really matters. It probably matters more where you're going to plant them. You know, how big a tree do you want? Do you want shrubs? Do you want trees? Do you want the beautiful draping foliage of the weeping willow? Do you want something that uh, is going to break your foundation of your house? <laughs> there's, there's lots of other considerations. Yes, uh, absolutely right. And I will tell uh, folks that if you haven't used it before, the Grow Native Native Plant Database could be very useful. Uh, we have many trees and herbaceous plants, over 330. So, and it's searchable. So you can put in if you have sun or shade, if you have a dry area, wet area, and you will get, uh, you can filter on many different categories. And then you will, um, you can also filter on host, host plant although most plants are host, most native plants are host plants. Um, so you may find that to be useful. And Chris is absolutely right. It's all about the right plant in the right place. Um, there's uh, in prairie willow is another, it's a prairie species. And I think that is host to the viceroy, I believe. Is that right, Chris? I think it might be. I do not doubt that. Um, well, there was one final question about, do you raise the pawpaw sphinx moth, Chris? I have not raised pawpaw sphinx. I've run across it occasionally, but I've not raised it. And of course, the so many That's of these- Spectacular oh. caterpillar. I, I think that would be a, a great one for us to display if I ever get eggs. And as some of the comments have noted, of course, many of these host plants also provide uh, pollen and nectar for, for adult uh, pollinating insects. There aren't any more questions. Um, thank you, Chris, so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we encourage everyone to visit the Roston House uh, in Springfield, visit uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation Prairies, um, we have many events coming up. We have another webinar in two weeks on prairie and native plant careers. We will have a webinar um, from Betsy Betros on dragonflies uh, toward the end of September, I believe that is. We have a evening on the prairie event at, on October 1st at our Goodnight Henry Prairie, which Chris mentioned, uh, where he has looked for regals. That will be October 1st. It's a free event, although there will be an optional ticketed barbecue dinner and even tent camping on the prairie. We also have two hikes coming up, guided hikes, one to Union Ridge Conservation Area in Northern Missouri on September 10, and uh, a guided hike to Fultz Hill Prairie in Illinois, just south of uh, Bell, or not too far south of Belleville, Illinois. So do, uh, um, Look for, a, for an email soon from Erica, either tomorrow or the next day with a recording, uh, a link to the recording of this webinar and many of the resources that were mentioned today. And what a lovely video to end on. Thank you for that, Chris. Thanks, <laughs> thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone for joining us.
And thank you, Erica, for all that you did to set up this webinar. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.